So I just want to welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Coach Rob, and it's good to be back. Uh, for those that were in the first presentation, it's good to see you again. Um, tonight, I wanted to go over uh, a subject that is pretty volatile, and that is why you guys are working out so hard and you guys are still gaining weight. Um, in the last uh, presentation, we talked a little bit about how stress kind of drives the body, and that's we're going to spend probably 15 minutes reviewing that for those that weren't at the first uh, presentation. Um, there are no silly questions, I'll say that first and foremost. Um, I know there was quite a buzz floating around because I mentioned eat ice cream and some other things like that. Oh, that yeah. quite, a, uh, quite a buzz. Uh, Deb wasn't real happy with me. Yeah. Um, and we'll explain why ice cream is an absolute staple and uh, that probably won't bring me back. That's but, the only reason George is here. That's, that's the only it. reason I got my brother here. I was told there was a couple ice cream. Yeah. Kids, uh, I did a CBS presentation and uh, we brought up ice cream and that was the whole focus of the whole show. Seriously, it was pretty interesting how people gravitate towards it. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to kind of break down some of the bureaucracy and BS associated with what works and what doesn't. You know, you've, you've heard these words, carbs, protein, and fat, and you know, Monday protein's good, by Friday it's bad, fat's good, fat's bad, what are you supposed to eat anymore? Um, one of the things I want to do is I, I want to demystify how your body works. I think there's a lot of misconfusion out there, high intensity, low intensity, I don't know how much you guys like to educate yourselves. Uh, my biggest nemesis is the internet, because everybody's a pro, everybody's a professional, and everybody's pretty much wrong, unfortunately. Because they usually run an agenda. Uh, they're trying to get you to buy something, whether it's a bar or a can of something. Um, what I want to do is educate you guys on what's going on in your bodies, and how you're training it, and how you're feeding it, and how it's either going to result in your building muscle and burning fat, or you're putting on more fat and not burning as much muscle, which leads to a lot of frustration and usually quit. You know, that's just the reality of it. So the first thing I want to do is get you guys to understand when we look at food, we look at it as carbs, protein, and fat. And some of you have may have read about it. That's considered a macronutrient. And I always want to give you the terminology that goes with it. So if someone throws out, oh, what are your macros? This is what we're talking about. Carbs, protein, and fat. When you look at um, the other side of the coin, when you look at uh, vitamins and minerals, it's pretty simple. It's fruits and vegetables. Okay, so what you don't realize is when you eat something that has carbs, protein, and fat in it, the vitamins and the minerals are actually what we call catalysts of energy. I know you may not like science, but don't make it any more complicated. These cannot convert to energy unless you have a presence of vitamins and minerals. So if somebody says to you, oh, I don't eat bananas because they're high in sugar, they're wrong. Okay, because there's vitamins and minerals in a banana. Now, yes, you can get it from a kiwi, just like you can a banana. There's a lot of overlap in that regards. But I would, I would encourage you to not go into an absolute silo and say, I'm not going to eat any fruit. I'm on a no-sugar diet. Because you've got to think about the generation of energy. That's why you're in here. And I see this happen quite a bit. Your intentions are really good. And then you get in here, and you literally, your energy is just waning. And you're like, gosh, what's going on? You know, I'm on a high-protein low fat diet, I don't have the energy to finish my workout, a lot of times this is what's missing. Because somebody wants to sell you that there's too much sugar in fruit. That's crazy, okay? If you look at how all the, all the uh, when you look at the category of food, how it all in integrates with one another, these cannot exist without these and vice versa. And what you guys are all about is, you want to go out and you want to lift and you want to do cross training and cardio, the rower, the treadmill, and everything else that's out there. If these two aren't working together, you're always going to have some piece of the puzzle that's going to be missing, okay? One of the things that I want you guys to understand is when we look at food, food completely dictates quality of sleep. And for those that were in the last presentation, you know how I'm going to present. We're going to throw some, some various topics, and then we're going to bring them all together so you'll have that aha moment where it's like, okay, I know what a macronutrient is. I know what a, this is actually a micronutrient. Sleep is derived from your food. So if you go to bed hungry and you're starving yourself, and I mean that kindly, you're eating a low fat, no fat, low calorie diet, there's a hierarchy of needs where your body is not going to go to sleep. All right? And when you get to sleep, there's three levels of sleep, and most of you have seen it before. It's just REM one, two, and three. REM is just rapid eye movement. Level one rejuvenates the brain, and level three rejuvenates the body. This is what we call a transitional phase. So with, with most of our clients, um, we serve around 7,000 clients around the world. 
And what we do is we build nutrition programs to get athletes and individuals what they want, whether it's burn fat, build muscle, win championships, whatever it is. This is something that we evaluate. Food we always evaluate, and we're going to get into exercise. Okay. What I want you to understand is majority of you, if you have a child at home, especially the women, you guys spend most of your time right here when you sleep. Okay. And unfortunately, nothing rejuvenates in the body when you're in transition zones too. So there's some sleep watches that are out there. Some of the new heart rate monitors have gotten really sophisticated where you download your heart rate data. They've gone to the new infrared off the wrist so you don't have to wear it around the, around the chest. We look at sleep patterns on a daily basis because when you first fall asleep, the first 20 minutes that you fall asleep, your body releases what we call HGH, human growth hormone. That is the hormone that makes you lean. Okay, I'm hoping you guys are starting to go, ah, this is starting to make a little more sense. If you don't eat, which we're going to talk about, you're not going to sleep. If you don't sleep properly, you don't release HGH, you're going to get fat. And that's what we're going to talk about cortisol. You're like, that's a lot of big names. We're going to water it all down so it makes sense, okay? So what I want you guys to understand is, if you are not sleeping, if you have night sweats, if you're craving simple sugars, and you have a low sex drive, your adrenal system is under attack. And you go, okay, another big word, adrenal. Well, let me complicate it with even bigger words called the parasympathetic system. You guys know it as fight or flight. You almost get in a car wreck, tires screech, also you get that flush feeling. Well, that's cortisol dropping into your system because your adrenal system is like, oh my gosh, I almost got in a car wreck. What hurts you is when you get high levels of cortisol in the blood, it is literally a fat magnet. So you can be in your training, your brain's out, you can be dialing in your nutrition. If you don't manage stress, your blood cortisol levels are going to go up and you're going to start to get heavier, okay? Particularly for the women that are in the room, think about it. When you got pregnant, you ate perfectly, you exercised diligently, you slept religiously, you even gave yourself a nap, and then you gave birth and what would you do? The antithesis of all of that. You ate what's left in the jar, you don't sleep at all, you don't exercise, and, it just, and so what happens is all of these variables start to work against you because you're not sleeping, so you're not releasing HGH, you just got heavier. Okay, you're not getting enough food, so you're not sleeping, so you don't have enough energy to exercise. You're getting heavier. You say, well, wait, Rob, we're coming in here talking about why are we exercising and still gaining weight? We're going to talk about it. We're going to bring it all together. But I wanted to kind of review for those that were at the first presentation and then bring the rest of you up to speed. If you don't get enough carb, protein, and fats, you're not going to sleep well. If you don't get to sleep quickly, your body doesn't really say shit, and it's not hard. Think about this. The quicker you get to sleep, the more HGH you're going to release. The sooner you're going to release it. So you want to get to sleep, but you want to get into the deepest level of sleep as quickly as possible because then when you guys come in here and you tear the tissue down, that's where the rejuvenation comes in. Now don't misconstrue. Your body at level three of sleep is rejuvenating, but it's using the food that you ate those two together is what creates lean muscle and burnt body fat. Don't want you guys to make it any more complicated than that. Think about it this way. You lay down to sleep and you stare at the paddle fan all night long. You're not getting into this room. You're not even getting into REM 1. You're staying right here in 2. You go, well, why would it skip 1? That's just the way the body works. It's a transitional phase. It's saying, do I go into 1 or do I go to 3? We have, we have um, graphs that we can run off of uh, heart rate watches. And it'll tell you how much time you spend in REM 1, 2, and 3. And we've had athletes and what we consider our, our general fitness, they'll spend the entire night in REM 2. So you're talking eight hours of laying there, and you think you're doing a great job, you're doing your body a service, and you're not getting anything out of it. And that becomes a huge eye-opener for a lot of people because what I do is I drive it back to carbs, protein, and fat. Okay? If you guys are taking notes, this will probably be the most important thing that you're going to get out of what we're going to talk about tonight which is a segue to the ice cream, okay? The only thing that satisfies appetite is protein and fat. The only things that satisfy hunger is protein and fat. So if you're on a low fat, no fat diet, that's why you're always hungry. That's why we need something with no fat, you're ready to eat 30 minutes later. Nothing is satisfying your hunger because protein and fat are the only things that satisfy appetite. 
so did Deb to joke about the ice cream, okay? I don't care where you get your protein and fat from. If you want to be good and do an avocado and an apple, go ahead. I like ice cream. It has protein and fat. I'm doing ice cream before bed. Do what you want, okay? Now somebody will yell, well, there's a lot of simple sugar in it. You've got to go with a high-quality ice cream. Okay, because a high quality ice cream like a Haagen Dazs or something like that has a lot of fat and a lot of protein, and that brings the sugar content down of the ice cream. So, if you were to go to the store and you get one of those rounds of, of sugar, like those little orange, pick it up. Notice how there's, it's so light. There's no density to it. Where's the density come from? Protein and fat. So, when you pick up a little pint of Haagen Dazs, you know, it's quite heavy. Now you know why. Because there's true density to it. Okay? That's what I want you guys to understand. So, before you go to bed, 15, 20 minutes before bed, I want you eating something that has protein and fat. You can do ice cream, you can do avocado, you can do an egg sandwich, you can do whatever you want. Because what am I trying to get you to ultimately? Right here. See, the sleep is preceded by the food, not the other way around. And so when you lay down at night, there's a hierarchy of needs. It's thinking to himself, okay, I know she wants me to go to sleep, but I'm hungry, so it keeps waking you up. That's why you have headaches. That's why your stomach growls. That's why you sit there and you toss and you turn. And you're like, I'm just, i got to be dedicated, i got to be disciplined. So you lay there and you starve all night long, and then you stay in transition phase. You wake up and you haven't helped yourself at all. Do you see how that works? So whenever we have somebody that comes to us with these issues, what we do is feed them high-quality fat. Avocados, extra virgin olive oil, raw coconut, raw nuts, just real food. There's no fancy, see that's what I'm trying to get you to understand. There's nothing fancy about it, it's just the truth of what... If the adrenal is under attack, what you're missing is essential fatty acids. You guys will see it, you know, the acronym, whenever you guys go online. And again, people will say to me, well, um, how do I know when I'm out of adrenal fatigue? Well, I look at it the other way. If you have one or all of these, you have adrenal fatigue. Because if you can't sleep, people say you're overstressed. If you have night sweats, you're premenopausal. If you're craving simple sugars, you're about to have your cycle. And if you don't have a sex drive, it's because you're not 18 anymore. There's always some lame excuse for everything that's up there. And the people that were here last time heard the exact same comment, okay? Because I've seen it for 33 years, all right? This, whether, and I know some of the females will say, yeah, a guy can turn this on and off, okay? But for the most part, when your body goes through its normal cadence, circadian rhythm is the official term of it, you should be tired after spending an all day working and, and working out and doing what you do as a human being. You should be like an infant. When your head hits a pillow, you should be out. You should be out. And you should drop into this real fast. Okay? Um, night sweats, again, if, you're not, if your adrenals aren't getting enough fat, you're going to sweat. It's just the way it is. Okay? Now, I don't want anybody to start throwing darts at me. Well, well my doc's got me on topical cream and I'm on injection for hormone replacement. I'm not trying to supersede the doc. I haven't seen your blood work. But I will tell you, I've seen a lot of prescriptions for topical creams that aren't necessary. We've, we've changed more with food than we have with topical creams. I'm not overriding a doctor. Please don't go out here and say, oh, cut off, you can fix the doctor. Simple sugars, again, particularly you women, you guys get accused of having a sweet tooth on that time of the month and all that. That's not what we're after. I'm talking if you don't get a piece of cake, you're going to hurt somebody. <laughs> That's the kind of hunger I'm talking about. And then again, this takes care of itself. Um, you know, there should be a natural urge for that. And that's all there is to it. It's hormonally driven, hence the word the adrenal system. So to keep the adrenal system firing on all eight cylinders, we need high quality fats. And that's where people, the word fat gets out of control. It's very simple. It's avocados, it's, um, your, your salmon, your high quality uh, essential fatty acids takes care of the adrenals. So now when you go to sleep, you feed yourself, you sleep, you, you transition in and out of the body to the brain, so you wake up rejuvenated, and at the same time, the rest plus the food is what rebuilds the adrenal system. Okay? The one thing that I want you guys to understand, and particularly, and I don't mean to keep picking on the, I'm not picking, I'm leaning towards the females, is you guys are really, really stubborn. Um, if it was up to guys to reproduce, we'd have like seven people in the world. I say that every time I speak because your tolerance for pain is way, way, way out of normal. Okay? And the reason why I say that is if you're going through these struggles, you just chalk it up to something else. That's just the way it's supposed to be. When we get over to exercise, if it's not blood curling difficult, you don't think you've done anything productive. That's just your mindset. I don't know if it's from having a child or what it is. But maybe starting at, you know, when you hit puberty. The thing that I want you guys to understand is you have to listen to what we call biofeedback indicators. If you're laying down and you can't sleep, I don't know how much more of a red light you need. 
Okay? If you've got night sweats, I mean, how many more indicators do you need? You've got two of the four already, okay? And then you get down to the simple sugars, you're like, oh yeah, I've got that. Well, how many more do you need? If you've got one, you've got them all, as far as I'm concerned, okay? The way to feed it is with the essential fatty acids. And if you understand the idea that you need to be eating these macronutrients with essentially fruits and vitamins, excuse me, with fruits and vegetables, these two work together to satisfy appetite. You're going to sleep deeply, and then you're going to feed the adrenals. The, the next variable that we want to look at is the amount of stress that you guys have in your life. And most of us think about stress with bad relationships, a job that stinks. You know, we've got our con, kind of our common things. I want you guys to think about these three variables on top of that. We just broke them down individually. And the reason why I say that is when we look at food, we look at food in two capacities. Very simple, quality and quantity. Once you clean up the quality, and that's why I put the calories up here, if you're eating lots of fruits and vegetables and you're eating a lot of protein, it's not calorically dense, okay? Um, tomorrow morning, I want you guys to go and make four extra large eggs. I don't care how you do them. Scramble them, omelet it, sunny side them, poach them, doesn't matter. Four extra large eggs only has 300 calories. But look at the volume of food that's on your plate. You're like, oh my gosh, roll me away from the table, okay? So when we're looking at food and we look at quality and we look at quantity, what ends up happening a lot of times is you kind of feel like you're at the feeding trough all the time because you're eating every couple hours. That's what we have all of our clients do is they eat every two hours from the moment you wake up until you go to sleep, every two hours. And we've all heard the stories, you know, small versus big meals. Just graze all day long. And we're going to talk about stabilizing blood sugar because that's really what you guys are looking for. If your goal is to lose weight, then you've got to stabilize blood sugar. Why? Because once you become hungry, you're like a Tasmanian devil in that pantry. Okay, and what's in the pantry? All carbohydrates. Nothing in a pantry, in fact, your pantry should be pretty much empty except bottled water. Because it's just, we're going to talk about that in a second. I'm not shop. Okay, because that's where you're going to go to when you're hungry. You've been at work all day. You're hungry. What do you do? You tear into that pantry. What's in that pantry? Crackers. Bag of chips, crackers. And we're, for those that were in the last presentation, you know how to shop now. And we're going to talk about how to do that. Okay, but what I want you to understand is when we're looking at stress, Yes, you've got a bad boss, bad relationship, financial stress, relationships and all that go with it. But what about your food? Are you getting enough quality, i.e. fruits and vegetables and lean meat? And are you getting enough quantity? My experience has been you don't eat enough. Which, if, if you've struggled with weight your whole life, that seems completely counterintuitive. You think eat more and lose weight? Absolutely. Absolutely, 100%, yes. Because of these things that we just talked about. You will, you will start to burn fat like nobody's other. Sleep, same thing, we look at quality and we look at quantity. Ideally, eight hours of sleep, optimistically 10 hours if you can get a two hour nap, okay? Because people say, well, if you take a nap, you're being lazy. No, remember when you take a nap, what do you do? You release HGH. So every nap helps, it's gonna make you leaner. You always will wake up from a nap leaner, okay? Exercise, that's where we get into these right here, okay? So for those of you that are taking notes, this is where we're gonna to start to tie it all in together and I'm hoping you'll have that aha moment. When you guys come in and you exercise, you've gotta ask yourself on a weekly basis, how often are you coming in frequency? How long are you in here for? And at what intensity are you lighting it up? Okay? Um, I'm not here to sell heart rate monitors, but I think everybody should own one. Okay, heart rate monitors, as far as I'm concerned, tell us everything. And I don't care if you're um, what we call speed and agility, which would be a ball and stick sport, softball, baseball, lacrosse, anything that involves acceleration, stopping, re-accelerating, um, I think you should be with a heart rate monitor. If you're an endurance athlete, mountain biker, runner, triathlete, you should have a heart rate monitor. If you're in here to lose weight, heart rate monitor, and I'll show you why here in a second. So when we look at exercise, what I always look at is what is the athlete or the individual, and to me those are synonymous, I'm not saying I'm not putting one above another, okay? What I'm saying for the individual is, are you training so often that your body never gets a chance to rejuvenate? And this is why people will actually, we've, uh, we've, had, we've done some clinical studies and studied other coaching programs where people have actually gained between 10 and 12 pounds of pure body fat training for a marathon, okay? Because what happens is they train six days a week, they train way too long, and they train at too high of an intensity, which then overloads the adrenal system, 
the adrenal system produces excess cortisol, and cortisol is a fat magnet, so they gain weight. So what do you do when you start to gain weight? What's the first thing you're gonna do? What's the first thing to do? Stop eating. Stop eating, okay? So now you stop eating, then you don't sleep, so you don't get into REM3, so you don't produce HGH, so you gain more cort you get more cortisol in the blood, you're saying you put on more weight, so what do you do? You start exercising longer and harder. And now you've addressed, now you've roached the adrenals because you're not getting enough sleep and you're not eating enough. You see how this now becomes a complete circle for you? It's a vicious cycle. It's a very vicious cycle. And especially when someone, you know, all of you are in here with good intentions. You wouldn't be here otherwise. So here you are with the best of intentions and you're undermining your own self, not understanding the why, because protein's good, bad, fat, good, bad, you don't know. It's all good if it's real food, but it has to be evaluated because the big question that people ask me was, how much should I eat? My question, are you hungry? and eat more. I know that sounds sarcastic and I don't mean for it to be, but when you're eating cleanly, this is where we come back to quality, if you're eating cleanly, think about how many pounds of salad you'd have to eat, okay? I want you guys to think of something. There's 3,500 calories to a pound of body fat, okay? So when you step on the scale, and I'm gonna use loose numbers, all right, you step on the scale in the morning, you're 150, and you step on the scale at night, you're 155. Do the math, five pounds times 3,500, that's 17,500 extra calories you would have had to have eaten in a day to put on five pounds of body fat. Do Because I'm not a numbers person that way, because it's, it's total nonsense is what it is. But you guys have these digital scales you step on it and it says, oh, you gained five pounds today. So you're like, oh my gosh, I'm not gonna eat tomorrow, okay? Well, do the math. Is it realistic that you over consume 17,000? Especially, you know when you go to Publix and you get that bag of salad? You know those Ready Express bags? If you ate that entire bag, you would consume 85 calories. If you ate the entire bag in one sitting. So take, how many bags would that get to get to 17,500 calories? Do you see how that's a complete nonsense way of thinking? So that's why you will never, ever see me say cut calories. Ever, 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 ever cut calories. Because as you said, this vicious cycle starts to roll and then it's not reversible. Because if you're not sleeping, I know it's because of food. And if your food's messed up, I know it's gonna drive up your adrenals and your stress. And, and the problem is way back here. But what you see it is, I'm gaining weight. I'm getting heavier. What the heck is going on? What you don't want to do is start working out more frequently, adding more duration, and training at a higher intensity. Because all you're doing is throwing kerosene on fire. So that's why I want you guys to kind of, if you've looked at me on YouTube, you know, we have one series, it's called Stop the Insanity, and it's along the same thread of thought as this, is these types of numbers drive people insane. You know, because first thing they want you to do is quit eating, or what do they want you to do? Join Weight Watchers, Jenny Craig, this, 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 and this. What is Zone and Atkins and South Beach and all those guys, what do they want you to do? Buy their books, buy their meals, okay? Has anybody, and I don't want to be presumptuous, is there, is there anybody here that's not familiar with Zone, Atkins, South Beach, um, that whole, they're all kind of the same? Okay. I kind of know what other diets, but. That's yeah, what happens on those is they advocate no carbs, okay? And I'm gonna let you guys know. Now, if you've ever gone to buy one of their books, their books are like this thing. They're like 28 bucks, all right, they're really cool. And everybody that buys them does what? They go right to what they're allowed to eat. They don't want to do the science behind them, all right? So I'm going to give you a little bit of chemistry. And it's not as bad as it sounds, okay? When you eat a carbohydrate, a carbohydrate for our intense purposes today is, we'll call them a fruit and a vegetable, okay? When you eat a fruit and a vegetable, it provides you carbohydrates, Carbo and bear with me here because you guys are like, oh my gosh, science, don't, stop. <laughs> Carbs get converted to glycogen. Glycogen is nothing more than stored carbohydrate. So if you eat an apple, it stores in your body glycogen, either in your liver to feed your brain or your muscles to do physical activity. That's it, that's where a carb goes. There is a conversion process that they don't want to tell you about in Atkins and South Beach and Zone, okay? For you to convert an apple to store glycogen, you're gonna store, and there's a couple different schools of thought, you're gonna store a half an ounce of water for every gram you convert. So if I want you to lose 10 pounds in one week, what do I do? Don't let you eat any carbohydrates because you don't retain any water, so voila, you're down 10 pounds. That's how it works. 
If you look at your volume of food, this, this is why, remember when I put up here earlier that in the morning you weigh 150 and at night you weigh 155? It's for this simple little conversion. When you eat food, that's why for athletes, you can prehydrate with food. If I know I'm going to do a marathon tomorrow, that's you know, the old carbo loading, which is wrong, by the way, but this, this ideology is, is correct. So if I'm eating a lot of fruits and vegetables, guess what? I should be pretty well hydrated. So with every one of our clients, if you're not five pounds heavier at night than you are in the morning, then I know you're not telling me the truth about your diet because the mathematical equation takes care of itself. Because what we recommend, and we're going to talk about this next, Everybody's like, send me the ideal meal plan. Real simple. Walk in the grocery store, just walk around the perimeter. And then leave. Except get beer in the middle. And then leave. Other than that, there's no reason to go in the middle of the store. There's literally nothing. Because what's on the perimeter of your store? Produce, meat, dairy, bakery. And they go, oh, gosh, bakery, bad area. That's not. Okay? If you want to know if something is, is good for you, and some of you may have heard the glycemic index, if you take a, a piece of white bread and you put it in your hand and you wad it up, it's going to be about that big around. If you take a piece of pumpernickel or rye and you wad it up, it's going to be about that big around. Right? So the heavier it is, or in this case, the bigger the ball of bread, the lower it is on the glycemic index, the healthier it is for you. Just that simple. So I always do the weight test instead of opening up the bread and eating. I'll take this one. Just lift up the bread, loaf of bread. If it's heavier, it's lower glycemic, it's better for you. Right? You pick up a thing of Wonder Bread and you can be like, and you pick up some good rye or pumpernickel, it probably weighs a half a pound. All right? And it's low glycemic. So for you, at night, you should always be between three to five pounds heavier than you are in the morning if you're doing this correctly because of this simple little conversion. There's no way that you can store sugar in your system or convert food into muscle without there being a conversion rate. And that's where the chemistry people are like, oh, it's so hard. No, it's not. Okay? When you put gasoline in your car and you step on the gas pedal, there's conversion that goes out the rear exhaust. Think about it the other way around. You're trying to build something, right? So you've got to put the food in, and then there's got to be a conversion rate, and that's going to cause you to gain, this is by the way, and finish the, you're going to gain roughly a half ounce of water. Some people say it's 0.8, some say it's 0.5. I'm not here to argue over percentages. What I'm saying is understand that if you're eating fruits and vegetables, you should always be heavier at night than you are during the day. Now, the reverse of it comes in and says, well, how come I went to bed at 155 and I woke up at 150, but I didn't run all night long? Did I burn five pounds? Because remember, if we do our 3,500 calories times five, did you burn 17,500 calories at night? Well, then why'd you wake up five pounds lighter? Urination, digestion, respiration, bodily functions. So that's why I don't like these digital scales when you jump on them and you freak out because it's up five pounds. You know, like, it's got to be the same in the morning and the night. No, no, no. Should always be heavier at night. See the difference? You go, okay, Rob, so how do you measure body fat? You know, you, you guys want to be in, in bondage to the scale, okay? We do have all of our clients on the scale on a daily basis. The reason why we get them on the scale is if you go to bed at 150 and you wake up at 155, yes, I said it that way on purpose. You went to bed at 150 and you got on the scale at 155, what we're measuring is inflammation and swelling, which is a byproduct of you tearing your muscles down. The way that we evaluate if you're building muscle and burning body fat, soft tape measure. Okay? And we literally, we do the left and the right side of the body. So we're doing left wrist, right, we're doing right wrist, right forearm, right bicep. We're doing pecs around the nipples. We're doing belly button. We're doing hip bone. We're doing center of quads. We're doing center of calves. Because some of you guys hold on body fat in weird places. And then we do all of this, which we're going to talk about exercise and shopping next. And then after six weeks, we go, We'll rack that tape measure. Either you dropped some body fat or you didn't. Now, believe it or not, wrist is a great indicator for body fat. Okay? And a lot of people don't think about that. Because, and I'm not trying to embarrass any female in here, but you guys lose two inches off of your you know, your chest measurements, you'll say, oh, well, it's, you'll, you'll have some excuse for it. You know, if you lost, quote, unquote, the back fat, you guys always refer to it as back fat, um, you'll burn it, but then you come up with another excuse. Well, I'm down two cup sizes. All right, you win. The bottom line is you lost body fat. Okay, and I said this in the last presentation. I've gotten yelled at by husbands because I can't tell you where body fat's going to come and go from. And all of a sudden, she's two cup sizes smaller, and then the guy's like really irate at us. Oh, yeah. We've been, I mean, we've almost been terminated because of it. And the same thing with the women on your low cut jeans because we do a lot with triathletes. 
and we do a lot of seated hill repeats on the bike. And you're, I don't look at this as you know, some sex object. It's gluteus maximus and minimus. And that's what drives a bike up a hill. So we're doing seated hill repeats. Your butt sprouts and your low cut shorts don't work. They're done. They, don't, you're, they go find another coach. Because they don't look at it as muscle, and they don't look at it as burning body fat. If you stress a muscle tissue, which is what you guys do there, and you feed it protein, it's going to grow. If you want to get bigger muscles, you want to be you know, buff, you got to eat a lot of protein. How much? You can get your calculator out and figure out all day long. Take your body weight, convert kilograms, multiply by grams. Have fun. I'm not doing it. I look at what you eat. I look at the protocols that we give you. We take body measurements every six weeks. You're either getting leaner and faster or you're not. Pretty simple. But I want you to see these are the parts that people don't really want to dig into because I can't sell you a book if I give you this little analogy. That's why I'm saying in South Beach and Atkins and Zone, everybody buys it, they go right to what they can eat. But I can tell you, you can go, you can avoid buying any book by shopping the perimeter of your store and then eat as much of it as you want. Eat as much as you want. And for people who, and I'm being very serious when I say this, we work with a lot of eating disorders. And you've been told you're orally fixated and you can't shut your mouth and you're this and you're a grazer and there's all this negative connotation. That stuff's got to stop. And that could be from a spouse, it could be from a counselor, it could be from a high school coach, it could be from whatever. That's where a lot of these deep-rooted issues come from. Somebody's telling you that you're fat, you'll never be lean or whatever, you'll never be an athlete. We've seen and heard it all. It's crazy what people will say, okay? And people don't realize how powerful words are. So when I'm asking you to eat more food, and in the back of your head you got this little bird that's calling you a glutton and a pig and all this other stuff, then you screw up your sleep, then the sleep drives the adrenals into fatigue, then the fatigue drives more cortisol, and then you start getting heavier and heavier, and you start trying to work out harder, longer, and faster, drives more cortisol, then you're in a vicious cycle, like you said. Okay? So, any questions on this before I erase it? Because we're going to kind of tie it in one more step. Any questions? Anybody have an aha moment like, yeah, that makes sense? I really hope it's starting to make sense to you guys. And I don't want you to think, oh, he's so technical. Just think about it. This is your fight or flight. And when this is under attack, your body's going to gain weight. If you're not sleeping well and you don't release HGH, you're going to gain weight. If you're not sleeping well, you need to eat more carbs, protein, and fat. It's, it's literally that simple. Okay? So at the very top of this, I have what I call an energy matrix. Okay? And the energy matrix is why a heart rate monitor is so very important. I'm going to go through it twice because I want to make sure you guys fully understand. When we talked in this category here, we talked about this in regards to food. You eat whatever you eat around the perimeter of the store. Everything that you eat is converted into carbs, protein, and fat. So when you read your label, if you want to know how many, um, how many calories are in something, They'll say that this particular piece of bread has four grams of carbohydrates, which means four grams times four calories per gram, you're going to get 16 calories. You keep doing the math and you end up with a total. Okay, so now you guys know how to read labels. People are like, labels are hard. No, they're not. It's a simple mathematical formula. If it says it has four grams of carbs and there's four calories to every gram, there's 16 calories. You add them up, that's how many calories that particular food item has. You go, why is that important? Because if it doesn't have fat, put it down. You need to eat full fat everything, all the time, full fat. Get rid of lights, get rid of fat freeze, get rid of everything. What is it that they're taking out? And that's a stupid question, if it's fat free, right? The only thing that satisfies appetite is what? Yeah, so that's why you're hungry all the time. And when you're hungry all the time, you're grumpy. When you're grumpy, your kids don't like you. Your spouse doesn't like you, you don't like you. So why are you taking fat out, okay? But the key is, is the quality of fat has to be good, okay? Shop the perimeter of your store, that's your good fat. Avocados, salmon, your lean meats. See how easy this is to fix? If it's in a can, a box, or a bag, don't eat it. Very simple, which eliminates 98% of the grocery store. Now you go, that's unrealistic. You know, I've got to have my brown rice. Right I'm not, I don't live in this you know, glass house. Choose your battles, all right? The one thing I want to say about when you're combining foods is, like for example, I will not eat brown, uh, uh, what do they call it, wheat spaghetti. That's like carbon. Don't even put it on my plate, I'm not going to touch it. I don't care how bad it is for me to eat white. So what I'll do 
is I'll do just a little bit of white spaghetti, but then what I do is I make a meat sauce that's high quality lean meat with stir fried vegetables and everything else and some red sauce, and it's like a 10 to 1 mixture. So what I do is I bring the sugar content down of my bad white spaghetti, but I'm inundating it with high quality fat and protein loaded with vegetables. So I'm getting my microvitamins, I'm getting my protein and fat, I got some carbs that taste good. You know, yeah, they're not the best, but if you want to be all hellfire and brimstone, go for it. I'm not. Life's too short. It's like ice cream. You should have it. Okay? So what I want you guys to understand is we've already solved the problem for food. Clean it up by eating around the perimeter of the store and eat every two hours. If you get hungry, eat more the next time you eat. So, for example, um, we'll have our clients maintain a food log for one week. You go, oh, my gosh, another full-time job. Just do it for me for one week. And then what we do is on our food log is you document what time you ate, how much you ate, and how you feel 15 minutes later. There's the key. Because if you've eaten something and you're doing the old head nod at your desk, you know, or you're driving and you're about to wreck your car, you're having an adverse reaction to something that you ate. I don't know what it is. If it's, if it's eating around the perimeter of the store, usually those conditions will take care of themselves. Okay? Um, and I'm happy to send this to you guys. Um, we do what's called a two-week food challenge, where we take all the simple sugars and all processed foods out of your diet. And then what we do is then we reintroduce one item at a time. And I gave this illustration in our last presentation, but I think it's worth repeating. We had a lady that took coffee out of her diet, which coffee, if you're just doing straight black coffee, is not going to put any weight on you. It's just a stimulant is all it is. She had taken coffee out over the two weeks, and then she put that in as her first one. She was like Jones in Fort, right? She ballooned up. I mean, just ballooned up. And she's like, see, I told you, you're wrong, Coach Rob. I'm not wrong. And I say that politely. What happened was, it was the creamer she was putting in had sucralose, and she has, she's unbelievably sensitive to sucralose. Okay? So all we did was change her creamer, which allowed her to keep her coffee, but she didn't have the same reaction. It wasn't that it was a bad item, it was a reaction. That's what I want, because that's the whole idea behind a glycemic index. You're carbohydrate intolerant. Usually it's because the carbohydrate is too simplistic and you get an insulin spike and that's why your energy levels wane the way they do. Okay, so that's why we have our athletes eat, document the time, the quantity, and what, and then how do you feel 30 minutes later. If you're falling asleep, look back at your food log. Take it out, change it, adjust it. When you can get to where all of your meals, every two hours, your like, energy levels are great, your mental clarity is great, there's your snapshot. That's where we start. Then we have to go into quantity because you're probably not eating enough of what you're doing. And you go, why does that matter? Because you're not building the muscle that you're in you're trying to do or burn the body fat that you're trying to burn. So you get frustrated. So what do you do? We're back over here. You start blitzing yourself in the gym again. And there's the vicious cycle. I'm starting to see some head nods. I can start to really resonate with people. Okay? So when you guys come in here and you start exercising, you have to understand you've eaten food right to build muscle to incur, improve your sleep to feed your adrenals you've consumed food awesome job now you're coming in here and you're converting the stored food into energy did i lose anybody on that because food takes on two different capacities what you're eating to build muscle and burn fat but then now it's got to fuel your exercise that's where this energy matrix comes in all right so what this is, is this is representing very easy exercise all the way up to 100% effort. This is just wide open. Okay, you're on the treadmill, just wide open. You're running wide open. You're on the rower doing a 5 by 100 with one minute rest. I want you guys to pay attention to these two words because this is where fat and sugar that are down here in food, because this is where your sugars come from, okay? You're now burning what's stored in your body. And here's what I mean. As the intensity level goes up, this is, this is a continuum, as the intensity level goes up, you burn a higher percentage of sugar. This is where the frequency, duration, and intensity is undermining your efforts. So if you're out here going wide open and you're doing it for a long period of time, all you're doing is burning a larger percentage of sugar. You're on this side of the intensity scale. That's where your heart rate monitor becomes invaluable. I go back to what I said about females. You have a high tolerance for pain. So we've done some anecdotal testing with clients where we'll have more heart rate monitor and we'll cover it up. We're like, okay, Suzette, go get on the treadmill and do a three mile run 
what you consider easy. And the Harvard data is just capturing data, right? She's punching all the buttons. We're not influencing it at all. She comes off of the, the treadmill, and we ask her for an easy three mile, and the average heart rate that she gives us is 165. All right. Now we say, Suzette, I want you to run three miles on the treadmill just as fast as you can go. She comes off the treadmill as fast as she can go, and her average heart rate is 165. She only has one gear. Because your perceptions, this is an easy run, you tell yourself it's easy, it's easy. But the heart rate is telling you something completely different. And if I know, let's just say for example, let's say your max heart rate, if I'm using loose numbers, is 170, as a percentage of the whole, you're training right here. How much sugar are you burning? A boatload. How much fat are you burning? Next to none. Okay? Because and I, this gets into a lot of blood chemistry and I won't bore you with it, but you will never ever burn fat exclusively, or excuse me, sugar exclusively or fat exclusively. They're always working together. It's a percentage, it may be minute, but there's always a percentage. So you might be burning 2% fat to sugar and you go, well, what about protein? In a most clinical setting, protein will ever produce is about 15% of total energy. So if I'm looking at 100% energy and I know 15% is coming from protein, then I know that I'm looking at 85% of your total energy, and that's why I only focus on fat and sugar. Does that make sense? I'm not really worried what your protein expenditure is, because it's really, you're, you're coming in here telling me that you want to burn fat. Then why are you training up here at this intensity level? Well, I don't know. That's well, because you don't have a monitor. Okay? There's all kinds of graphs on the walls. You can do your wrist, multiply by four. Good luck. If I'm hauling the mail on the treadmill, I don't want to be trying to get my pulse and then multiply by four. You're not going to do it. So what are you going to do? You're just going to keep pushing and pushing and pushing. You're going to be burning more stored sugar, but yeah, you told me you want to burn fat. See the insanity cycle? If your intensity is too high, you're either burning a higher percentage of sugar or a higher percentage of fat. So with our weight loss clients, what do I do? Get on the treadmill and walk between 110 and 120 beats and do it for 30 to 45 minutes and do it five days a week and watch the body fat drop off. But this is where I come back full circle. You women go, nope, too easy, not doing it, I'm out. You will, I, I'm telling you, I've done it for 33 years. You will argue with me until you're in the Because if it's not intense or painful, you don't think it works, okay? It's kind of like the sleep. I had um, some people uh, say, you know, I tried your, I took your challenge, I did the haagen before bed, and that night I slept better than I have in six months. Congratulations, do it again tonight. I'm not trying to be sarcastic, but when you find what works, why do we deviate from it? Because you hate to be successful. You do. Human beings, pardon me? Human beings are petrified of success. Why? Because if you get a little bit of success, then there's this expectation you've got to keep it up. I get it, all right? We've, we've won a lot of championships in our different sports. The first championship is not hard because we know the blueprint that we got them there. It's getting them to trust it so they'll do it again for the second championship and the third championship, especially when you're dealing with stubborn humans, okay? Because I can give you all the data, and that's what we do for a, bit, for a living. It's all we do. I, I give you resources where you can track your body weight and your resting heart rate, and there's ways that we do it. We do a lot of rhythms and analyticals to tell you if your adrenals are under stress. Okay, you just have to keep track of three data points, and we do all the analysis behind the scenes. We can look at your sleep logs, and we can tell you whether or not you're getting into burn one, two, or three. So we can tell you if you're gonna be burning more body fat. It's not about trying to sell you on service. It's about, do you understand, you're in here busting your butt at five, six days a week, and you're doing it for 60 to 90 minutes and you're in heart rate zone five, which by the way, think about it this way, this would be heart rate zone one up to heart rate zone five. That's what I mean by that. So you're just blowing the rev limiter out every time you get on here. So this is too often, that's too long, that's too high. So you're burning more sugar and then you say, I'm just destined to be fat because I'm not losing any weight and I'm training six days a week for 90 minutes, guts to the wall. And then when I don't lose weight because I'm burning more sugar and not fat, I'm going to go ahead and start starving myself, which then I interrupt my sleep, which then produces more cortisol, and then I'm destined to be obese. Because my dad was, my mom was, on genetically disposition. Okay? I don't know, I don't have any polite way to say it. Um, I'm adopted, and I can tell you that both my parents are morbidly obese, and I was up till seventh grade. Okay? And it's a cool little story, but um, the bottom line is, is the stuff I'm sharing with you is when I made it to the Olympic team for triathlons. 
So this isn't my opinion. This is stuff that comes from some of the best physiologists in the world, and they have nothing to sell us. That to me is why I started to grab onto it and started sharing it with people. Because nobody's gonna tell you about adrenal fatigue. They'll tell you the symptoms and they'll give you a pill and a shot and some topical cream, but I want you to go here. Well, how did you get there? Well, you didn't get enough food to drive your sleep to rejuvenate the adrenals, and then everybody told you fat was bad, but the fat is what feeds the adrenals. So you're gonna be big, you're gonna be heavy, you're gonna always struggle. And then what, what breaks my heart is then you come in here and you start to exercise and you can't even go for 30 minutes because you're wide open. You're not, a, you know, I will say this. If you're a 5K specialist, three mile runner, yeah, you've got to train up here if you want to be fast. But you didn't tell me you want to get fast, you told me you want to lose weight. What is your goal? So the first thing we do with all of our clients is you fill out a goal profile. I'm not going to tell you what to do. You tell me what you want to do, and I'll explain the science behind it, and we'll put together a training program, and we'll get you there. And I will tell you, you will not like me very much because of this. You guys want to argue with it. This doesn't, that makes so much sense, you don't want to believe it. Okay? And, you know, going back to the, the sleeping through the night. I mean, I've had women that they've tried melatonin, and they've tried Ambien, and they've tried, what's some of the other sleep additives that are out there? Um, the truth of the matter is that stuff doesn't even put you to sleep. It puts you in a false sense of REM. Okay, if you ever go study any of those, Ambien does not put you to sleep. It puts you in a false state of sleep. So if you're taking Ambien and you're not actually getting to this level of sleep, you're going to get more cortisol, which means you're going to gain more weight. But you're so frustrated because you can't sleep. So you get into an altered state. You might as well get drunk. I'm being serious. It's the same level of state. You do not rejuvenate when you're drunk. When you fall asleep in an inebriated state, there's two things that are killing you. One, as soon as you put the first drop of alcohol in your mouth, you immediately stop your ability to burn fat. That's why drinking in the evening is really detrimental. The other side of the fact is, you think that you're relaxed and rested, and you're staying right here the whole time in your mouth. Which is another reason why people gain weight. Oh, I just got a beer belly. No, you're in transition, and you're, you're stopping your fat burning ability. It doesn't mean don't drink beer. I'm just saying, you know, you gotta choose it smart. When it comes to drinking alcohol, you've gotta have a lot of protein and fat in there because it brings the sugar content of the alcohol down. That's just, I mean, we can talk about this for days and days and days. I just want you guys to understand when you're exercising extremely hard, you're burning sugar, not fat. When you guys go on a low fat, no fat diet, you're interrupting your sleep. When you don't sleep, you put on body fat, put on body fat by driving up cortisol, and then you fry your parasympathetic system. And then here's the things that start to pop up, and we go on. And then what do you do? Well, I'm gaining weight, so I'm going to go back up to you. There's just these three elements. And go back to the average of here. Most of you guys are working out way, way too hard. But if I ask you perceived versus actual, it's not going to be very far apart on the scale. Make sense? Or is it clear as mud? Any questions? Well, as far as the rim, I heard that uh, as long as you dream, that you're in room three, is that correct? Yeah, it's a fair, you know, it's a good, it's a good benchmark. It's a good benchmark. Um, some people argue, because it seems counterintuitive, if you're dreaming, you would think it's in, in the level right. one. My thing to your point is at least you're in one or three. What I always say is, not to be argumentative with you, if you don't have any dreams, you probably were in three. If you were dreaming, you probably were in one. But to your point, you had dreams, that's a good sign. At least you got one of two, okay? Um, one of the things that I want you guys to think about is when you wake up in the morning, I know most of us have to wake up to an alarm, but if you can avoid it, try not to wake up to an alarm. Okay, because if you're down here in REM 3, and that code red alarm goes off, it's going to drive cortisol up in your blood as soon as that alarm goes off. And that's another problem. Look at firefighters, look at police officers, look at uh, medical people. Their cortisol levels are through the roof. That's why we have such an obesity level with our service. You know, because they're always under pressure. They're always under the gun. I mean, poor firefighters and paramedics and stuff, I mean, just they try to get a cat up and it goes off again, and I think they're doing 24-hour shifts. Or I don't know if anybody's got a paramedic here, but I think it's 24 on, 48 off or something. Their cortisol. And then their circadian rhythms are all good stuff. You know, so then it's just a vicious cycle all the way around. So what a lot of those men and women do, they try to work out to try to put themselves to sleep, but all they're doing is they're overcooking the system because they don't take the time to eat because they're always on the run. And I don't want you guys to think I'm just making some blanket statements. Look at these different industries. What is it that's lacking? Lack of sleep. What's your sleep patterns like? Interrupted. 
what's the stress level like? Very high. You know? And, and I go back to, especially for the females, look at how lean, I always say, look at what your, your body weight was in high school before having children, and then look at where you're at now. You got this grandiose idea that being an adult is a cool thing, and so now also we have children, we have jobs, and we have relationships, and all this other stuff. And this is just going through the roof. This is getting beat to death, and this is non-existent. We get heavier and heavier and heavier, and we go, what happened? Stop eating, stop sleeping, stop doing this. Because mom and dad used to do all this for you. The pantry was always full, you knew you had to be in bed by 9 o'clock, as much as we hated it, we are all over lean. Some may be bigger, thicker bone than others, but we were a lot leaner than we were now, that's for sure. And you have to understand that this has been going on in your system now for however many years old you are. And if you guys would you know, start training with a heart rate monitor, and by the way, all these resources we have available to you guys for free. Because my big thing is knowledge is power. You know, like I said, um, what you'll realize is to, to start to track these uh, variables, it's not hard. And we have all those spreadsheets that are designed to program and read them and interpret the data for you. But that's what we do. You know, that's why we, uh, we create nutritional programs to get results that you guys want, whether it's burn fat, build muscle, athletic performance. Um, you're not going to find on our websites, you know, 13 week fat loss program. There's, I got to know what your what your sleep patterns are like. I need to know what to do for a living. Um, I'll give you an example. We have a 17 year old world champion that we work with, and he takes two rest days a week. And if you look at it mathematically, you would think, well, he's 17. You know, he's full of testosterone. He's got all this going for him. We did all kinds of studies, and we gave him a second rest day, and his performance went through the roof. Okay. So my point is you can't just take one generic, go, oh yeah, I'm 43, so I should do this. Screw that, that is so wrong. Uh, the other thing that I want to warn you about on this right here, some of you um, may have a better aware of it. There's a 220 minus your age, plus or minus your resting, uh, plus or minus your resting heart rate. Please do not use that. It is completely wrong. Um, I'll give you an example, and I, I mentioned this in the last presentation as well. I have two clients, uh, same age, at the time they were 41. The male, Bill, is literally six foot seven, and Wendy is literally five foot tall. Her max heart rate is 210, and Bill's max was 172, all right? So if I use this formula, 220, they're both the same age, plus or minus the resting heart rate, the number, like for example, Wendy would have to walk to stay in heart rate zone three, where Bill's head would be coming off of his shoulders in the same number. And you go, why does that matter? Because of this percentage, are you burning more sugar or more fat? So in that case, it, they, they both do Ironmans. The idea here is we work on strength to weight ratios and VO2 max and all kinds of an analytical numbers. The idea here is this margin of error is probably 50%. So my point is that I don't want you in here on the treadmill thinking you're down here, and you may actually be up here, as it was for for when, okay? That's why I don't like you guys to use generic formulas. Um, we try to take the guesswork out of it by giving you the tools. The tools are free. It's not like we're trying to sell you anything. I just want you to stop the insanity of what you're doing. You get frustrated and you're like, it's just not working. Or you think the gym doesn't work, but you gotta change gyms or you gotta change chainers or something. No, start with this. Start with this, all right? All right, any questions? Yes, ma'am. So you're talking about shopping the perimeter. Um, what about yogurts and cheese and peanut butter and oatmeal? And yeah, it's all good stuff. Yeah. You know, um, you bring up particularly oatmeal. I like that one a lot. You know, if you're using the, the cold cut, you know, the, the original, um, that's why kind of where there's some of those exceptions. It's not like you can find that in the perimeter, right. but at least it doesn't have any artificial sugars or sweeteners in it or anything like, or um, preservatives in it. Um, those are all good. Yogurts, full fat. Okay, milk, full fat. Um, any other questions on that? Because I want to elaborate. Full fat is where it's at. Yeah. Anything else in the middle of the store that I may have forgotten? Because oatmeal is a good one. I'll add that to my presentation. That's a good enough. Nuts. Nuts. Yeah, nuts, nuts are in there. Yeah. And, and not, to, not to kind of split hairs on that, but like the planters that's in the middle of the store is going to have a preservative in it because of the seal can. If you can get it in the produce section where they sell it in bulk, and it is expensive, you know, run to like a bulk store, like a Whole Foods or something like that, that helps. Um, and, and, and one thing that people will say is it's expensive to eat healthy. And we're actually doing a video series right now on how to eat on $4 a day, okay? Because like if you go to BJ's and you buy, like you may laugh, but I have two sons, and we buy 60 eggs and we go through them in a week. 
okay? But the 60 eggs are $5.40. You divide that by 60, each egg is like a penny and a half. And yes, we eat 10 at every meal, but the idea is it's not expensive, all right? Along that thread of thought, when it comes to a protein source, unless you have some kind of an allergic reaction to eggs, eat eggs all the time, particularly at breakfast, if you can. I don't care if it's omelet, like I said earlier, any form of egg is an egg is an egg. An egg is indexed at 100, okay? So if you guys, um, again, I don't know how much you guys like to self-educate yourself, but if you get, if you look up on the internet and you said, what is my uh, turkey breast, boar's head, uh, mm -hmm. what is the amino acid profile, and they say it's 86%, okay? And I don't want to say a word you guys may not be familiar with. Amino acids, okay? You do not build muscle by eating protein. You build muscle by absorbing amino acids from protein. So when someone says, I'm not gonna eat protein, it's a huge mistake, okay, because it has too much fat, okay? The thing I want you to understand is an egg is 100%. When you look at amino acid profile, an egg is 100%. What does that mean? Every amino acid that you need to build new muscle, an egg has it. And you have to eat both the white and the yellow because there's aminos in one that's not in the other. You go, oh, but my cholesterol's not. All right. As soon as you drop simple sugars, your cholesterol will drop. Because high cholesterol is your inability to burn triglycerides, which are sugars. It's not your inability to process fat. The reason being is, the way your body is set up is if you eat too much body fat, or excuse me, too much cholesterol, your body just produces less of it. It produces it on its own. Now, if you're on Lipitor and you've got a hereditary background of it, don't go home and stop taking Lipitor. First thing I'd encourage you to do is clean up your carb sources, which is get rid of anything in a box bag or a can. That will clean up your carbs, which will take care of your triglycerides, which will drive down your cholesterol. That's really the source of high cholesterol. Because your body produces cholesterol on a daily basis. The more you eat, the less it produces. The less you eat, the more it produces. It's just it's the way our bodies have been designed. Okay? But the thing I want you to understand is an egg is a perfect amino acid profile. So you want to try to get those in several times a day if you can. Throw them on top of your salads, hard boiled. You just can never get enough. Now the question comes up, and it did in the last presentation as well. The question comes up, well, can I get too much protein? I've never seen it in 33 years. Okay? Because the big thing is, oh, well, I'm going to feel it in my kidneys, right? Because my kidneys are working over. As soon as your kidneys start bothering, you stop eating protein. I've never seen that. Okay? And then here's the other side of the point. Oh, I'm going to I, I pass the kidneys so too much protein. No, that's dehydration. Okay, dehydration is what causes kidney stones, not too much protein, because most of us are dehydrated. Your big question on, on water and hydration is very simple. Take your body weight, divide it in half, and that's how many ounces of water I want you to take in on a daily basis. Take your body weight, divide it by two, and that's how many ounces of water you should consume on a daily basis. However, that does not include what you lose in the form of exercise. So if I weigh 150 pounds, I should be consuming 75 ounces of water on a daily basis. All right? I guarantee you, unless you're really anal about it, you know where it goes at. Unless you've heard it before, you're the only one that should know. Otherwise, you, and then what we do is we add the exercise on top of that. And we have a sweat rate calculator that we use with all of our clients. And what it does is it takes your pre-weight, it takes your post-weight, it factors in the ounces of fluids, and then you get a percentage of either up or down. And it tells you whether you need to drink more or drink less based on intensity, duration, and um, intensity and duration for this conversation. So this would be what you would want to take in from a water standpoint. If you're not getting enough water, you probably are going to have a struggle when it comes to sleep. Just an FYI for you. If you're having headaches and stuff like that, let's start with water. Okay? Any other questions? Comments? Yes, sir? If you can get eight, that would be ideal. And I know it's difficult when you know you've got to be up by 6 a.m. to try to get to bed by 10. I know that's hard. The other side of the coin, and I don't know if this is, uh, this is relevant to you or not, you may go to bed at 10, but then you lay there until 11, 15 at night. 
that's when I would encourage you to look at what you're eating before you go to bed. Because if you're not, you know, um, particularly for the moms that nursed, you know when you get done nursing how a child, you can pretty much drop him or her on their head because they're literally food drunk. Okay, that's what I want to, that's the level of inducement of sleep that we're trying to get on adults. You want that level of, you just cannot wait for your head to hit the pillow. Induce that with food. That's why I think ice cream is the best. Yeah. I want to say that after I listened to your seminar last time, I tried to um, do what you said about like every time you eat, you should eat a fruit, a vegetable, and a protein. Yeah. Um, so I went to Sam's Club and I meal prepped everything, cool. and it was really awesome. Um, I felt a lot better. I was drinking more water. Plus, I was getting more water in just from the vegetables and the fruits and stuff. Awesome. Um, and last, the weekend before last, I was my friends, and they made like all this food that was pretty unhealthy. And after I ate it, man, I felt so sick. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I felt like crap after I ate that food. For and real. People, and people don't understand how yeah. influential food is until you clean it up. Yes. And in, in our position, I don't live in a glass house, so I'm not going to slap your hands and tell you not to eat something. But in your case, you eat it, you feel lethargic, you don't want to eat anymore. I literally was nauseous after I ate it. And I'm like, and I don't man, mean I got to get back to my... Yeah, clean it up, right? Yeah. And I don't mean to embarrass you because you're young in the room, but you know the problem that you run into is you eat something and then you get gastrointestinal issues and raging diarrhea. I don't know why you keep eating it. That's why I say we know what makes us feel good, but for some stupid reason as human beings, we do exactly the opposite. And then you get the results that you're looking for, so what do you do? You go 180 degrees and go the other way again. I have nothing to say because when you come back to me in six months, I'm going to tell you the same thing. I don't know what else to tell you. And so for some of you that are trying to lose weight as a goal, that's why I always like there to be a, some kind of an event. I don't care, go walk a 5K, go do something, because you've been up and down this roller coaster of hitting a certain size or a certain number, screw that. If you can lose the weight by doing what we're talking about, and you get a t-shirt for a 5K and a finisher's medal, that's far more important to you than what the stupid scale says. And the truth be, you know, you'll sign up for the next race and then the weight will just keep coming off. And now you're, work, now you're focusing on something bigger than just hitting a scale or a size. And that's what we've had the most success with our weight loss market is, you know, you guys have seen the scale. All right, so you hit 155 again. Woo, been here 12 times. All right, I, am gonna, I know I'm running over by 10, but I want to say one thing real quick. For those of you that have been on the yo-yo diets, I want to explain why Weight Watchers and Zone, not Zone, but Weight Watchers and Jenny Craig and all, that's why they're a multi-billion dollar business, and that's why they do memberships for life, because they know you're going to fall off the bandwagon. All right, it's designed to fail. Sincerely, it's designed to fail. And let me explain to you why. If you're eating 1,500 calories, all right, and you go on Weight Watchers, and they put you on a 1,200-calorie diet, your metabolism is going to match 1,200 calories. Now, 1,200 calories are coming from their 3.2 boxes and their one drink and all this other crap, okay? But the idea is your, your basal metabolic rate will match 1,200 calories. It's what I call the tail of the snake. Wherever you put in, in the mouth of the snake, the tail is going to catch up to it. So now you just slowed your metabolism down, right? You get tired of eating out of boxes and cans and whatever, so now you go up to 1,600 calories because you're starving. You're tired of being hungry. Listen to me really clear. When you decrease your metabolism from 12 to, from 1,500 down to 12, you slow the metabolism down, your body thinks it's starving. So when you all of a sudden decide that you're going to go up this extra 400, so now we're up a plus 400. Remember I said to you earlier that food produces nine calories of energy for a gram of fat. If I'm starving and I want the biggest ROI, return on investment, I'm going to convert everything to fat because I get twice as much energy, right? So now this 400 extra calories gets put on at 100% fat. Because your body's thinking, I'm starving, I'm in preservation mode, anything that comes in my mouth, I'm going to convert to body fat. So you go from, you started at 150 pounds, you got down here because you're starving yourself, you're not eating a lot of carbs or whatever the water, so we're losing water weight, right? Then you're down here, you go from 150 pounds at 1200, let's say you get down to 145 just for even numbers, you're tired of being hungry all the time, you go to 1600, you were at 155, now you're 158. Sound familiar? Yes. Then, they, then they start bugging with your head. Well, when you were on Weight Watchers, you were down at 145, you were losing all the weight. So you do this, and then you do this, and then you do this, and, you do, and each time you just keep getting heavier and heavier and heavier. And you start at 150, and 12 years later, you're at 178 going, what the heck happened? Sound familiar? 
designed to fail, you'll never win. Because as soon as you cut calories, metabolism drops. As soon as you start cutting where you're getting your food from, everything flows downstream. The sleep starts to fall apart, and then all those numbers are starting to sit. That's what I don't want you guys to fall into. Never, ever, ever, ever stop cutting calories. Don't ever cut calories. Figure out where you're burning your calories from first, and then start making some minute adjustments. Like you were saying, how you feel. You know? Yes, ma'am? Um, so throughout the day, like in the morning time, I would do eggs with like a lot of vegetables in them, and mm -hmm. then a piece of fruit. Throughout the day, I would have like chicken, the chicken tenders I would grill for protein, and then just different fruits and vegetables. But should we be eating fat during the day, or just like the milk or the ice cream at night, or like? Go back to what you said earlier when you were trying to do a carb, protein, and fat, like you just alluded to earlier. Well, I was doing a protein, a fruit, and a vegetable. That's perfect. Like almost all the time, but. That's not perfect. really any fats or anything. Well, you're getting some fat from the protein. Okay, but you hear what she said? She's hungry a lot, right? So something's missing, protein or fat. So to your point, what I would do is um, I like Marie's uh, blue cheese dressing. It has lots of fat and it has zero sugars, a lot of protein in it as well. Use that as a dipping sauce. If that's, okay. not, that's nauseating to you, find mayonnaise, full fat mayonnaise. Dip it in that. What's in mayonnaise? It's egg and oil. <laughs> There's no sugar in mayonnaise, okay? Some people think it's gross, but to your point, use any salad dressing. Okay. Now, again, you can be hellfire and brimstone and say, well, I have to have ranch. Go for it. What's it have, like seven, eight grams of sugar in it? In the big scheme of what you're doing on a daily basis, make it palatable. Dose it, uh, cover it in extra virgin olive oil and some balsamic vinegar. Um, do your little Tupperwares where you can use it as a dipping mm -hmm. type of a thing. Okay. Um, but to your point, we always want to have some source of fat. Throw an avocado in there whenever you can, um, because the eggs don't have a lot of fat in them, mainly protein. Okay. Um, but I like what you said though; you were still hungry, so you knew there was something missing somewhere. Well, I was just, I was just eating more, like you said, because I was like, well, you said I won't get fat for eating fruits and vegetables, no, so. No. <laughs> and and I don't mean to put you on the spot, but did you have you felt your clothes getting smaller? Well, no, but it's the stress. Okay. The stress level. Okay. Um, and I was sleeping better because I did what you said too, like no more watching TV in my room because I noticed like the nights when I didn't watch TV, I would fall asleep and the nights that I watched TV, I was just up all night. Yeah. Like I would fall asleep and then the TV's off and I turn it back on and like just, yeah. so. Well just so people know what we were talking about there, when you go to bed at night, no computers, no TVs, no cell phones, no nothing because your brain, when it hears sounds, it wants to engage with that conversation. So you're never getting into REM 3 because it's trying to look for a conversation and engagement. Same thing when you go into the kitchen. Don't watch TV, cell phones, or anything else. Chew your food because that's where the digestion begins is right there. If you want to get more of the nutrients out of the food that you're buying from the perimeter of the store, chew them. I don't mean to be gross, but watch somebody at a restaurant. They'll bite, they'll chew twice, and they'll bolt. So now you're sending clumps of food down into your gut that that digestive enzymes have to break down. That's why we have peps at AC and all these other things selling like the wazoo. It only takes time to chew the food. We're all too busy. And we're distracted. So we're looking, bite, bite, swallow, bite, bite, swallow. And we're like, oh my gosh, I feel sick in my stomach. Even if they're eating good foods, because you haven't broken it down. The stomach's not designed to break down chunks of food, but we make it do it. So that's what she's referencing in regards to that. All right, well, thank you so much for your time. Oh, yes, ma'am. One question. So I missed last week. Um, yeah. But so you talk about grazing and you have two hours. Is it important that you eat? Um, the, the carb protein fat every time, or can I eat like an apple or? I would, I would encourage you to combine them at all times. So like an apple time. with almond butter, okay. you know, celery with some uh, blue cheese. Because what you're doing is, you, when you think about your belly, think about it kind of like a, it's a concoction of carbs, protein, and fat. So if there's no fat or protein, that sugar content's gonna be relatively high. We're gonna get an insulin burst. And remember how I was saying earlier, the goal is to stabilize blood sugar. When you put a carb, protein, and a fat together, that will always produce the lowest common or the lowest glycemic index possible. And it's sometimes hard. That's, I like what you're saying, that you're prepping your meals. Yeah, and honestly, I just put them in like sandwich bags. I put everything in like a gallon bag of yep. sandwich bags. And then throughout the day, I mean, even if it's just a couple pieces of celery and a piece of apple and then a couple bites of chicken, yep. yeah. it's still, you know, you're getting everything. At least that's what I was trying to do. <laughs> well, we have, our, we have our clients cook on Sunday for Monday. Then they click on Tuesday for Wednesday, Thursday for Friday, and then usually you guys will eat out on the weekends. If not, that's fine, continue that pattern. But the idea is literally cook eight or 10 chicken breasts so that it is available, put it in Tupperware. I mean, nobody runs through a drive-through because they want to. 
Most of us run through the drive-thru because we don't have a cooler sitting on our car seat that has fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, and some lean protein. But if you grilled all that, and I mean, I know it's kind of barbaric, but stick a fork in it and just drive Dude, it on the road. That's what I did. I mean, <laughs> I it's not the most romantic thing in the world, but it gets it done. You'll save a boatload of money because what you have to realize, when you run through that convenience or the uh, fast food, there's like 16 to 24 different forms of sugar in one burger. The bread, the junkiest sugar you could possibly get. People don't understand all the condiments on there. The mustard doesn't have any sugar. The ketchup has sugar in it. The pickles have sugar in it. The meat has sugar in it. And so all of a sudden now, you've got a fry, another sugar, that's in an oil, which is another sugar. You go into the burger, which has four or five forms of sugar. Then you put more ketchup on top of it. Then you have a milkshake or a soda. I mean, you wonder why your bloodstream is just doing this. And it's not, I hate to say this, the fast food, it's not the fat that's in the food. It's all the junk, it's all the sugar. We have more of an epidemic associated with ingestion of simple sugars than we do fat, by far. Sugar is the most addicting thing. I, I think it's the biggest epidemic we have over any drug that's out there. And I'll go to that against anybody on that Give a little kid that is addicted to sugar and try to take him off sugar and watch what happens. Look on those walls like a spider on people. He means business. I mean, look at it. It's like he's like a crack, he's like a crack addict. Now, I'm not saying that to be sarcastic for anyone who's battled addictions to drugs. I'm not. It's just to see little kids that are just jonesing when their parents really trying hard to clean it up. This kid's like a Tasmanian devil running the house. And we don't realize how it's hidden everywhere. That's why the two-week food challenge is really helpful because it tells you what you can eat and what you can't eat. And what you're allowed to eat, you can eat as much as you want. And the truth of the matter is we just never deviate from it. You just start adding your little things that you must have. Like I like beer and wings. So I put it in. I don't eat it very often, but I like it. I've got a lot to tell you it's healthy for you, but I like it. You know, it goes well. It's okay. So that's why I'm saying you'll never see me say, oh, no, it's like gluten-free. Everyone's like, go gluten-free? If you can go gluten-free, good luck. It's hard. Now, anyone that's done it has always told me they felt better. But that, I mean, unless you've got somebody that you know, has a celiac disease, that's a lot of work. It's yeah. a lot of work to avoid uh, gluten. That's one thing I was supposed to do is gluten-free, dairy-free, and it's really hard. Absolutely. It stresses me out for that. Sure. Just, yeah. just that one. You're reading everything and it hit a little bit, it makes you sick to your stomach and all that. So. All right, guys. Well, I'll stick around for a few minutes if you have any questions that you weren't comfortable asking in a group. But thank you for coming out and uh, we'll see you guys next month. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.